So our, our next speaker is Michael Brenner. Um, Michael has uh, worked on a variety of problems in nonlinear mechanics um, in fields ranging from physics to biological evolution. Um, much was um, mentioned this morning about um, the interactions of the applied math department with um, EAPS and other departments at MIT and back in the days of Lorenz and Charney. I can say that many of us have quite fond memories of when Michael was in our applied math department in the late 90s. And uh, he's now at Harvard. And with you, Michael. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me. You're nice. You've always been much too nice to me. Anyway, um, so um, I'm going to give a talk that relates to this meeting in various ways, but also doesn't really relate to meetings and this meeting in various ways. So we've been on this quest. I've basically been on this quest um, since I was a graduate student. I didn't even know when I was a graduate student that I was on this quest, but apparently I was on it, um, which was to, the question is, is could one actually see in real time what the turbulent cascade looks like? And um, actually, my thesis advisor told me to work on this problem, and I couldn't do it at the time. And sort of 20 years later, for some reason, I, it was like a crisis or something. I started working on it. And um, I'm here to report um, what we've been thinking about with this. And I mean, at the end of the day, this talk will have two things. It will have some ideas. It will have a really spectacular experiment by a grandson of Harry. Um, an academic grandson of Harry, not a real grandson of Harry. Um, and um, and, uh, and I, I guess it relates to what we heard in the morning um, because um, at least what I think is this is sort of a, a warning, a siren's warning song about just how under-resolved your simulations are likely to be. Um, so that's, if you'd like to think about that. So this is a much simpler problem. So OK, so can I get this thing? OK, so, the, so these are the people um, who sort of help, uh-oh. Um, so the, um, Harry's academic grandson, I think that's right, is Shmuel. Um, Shmuel? Shmuel. And, and, and Shmuel and his graduate student, Ryan, did what I think is really a stunning experiment that we'll, I will show you at the end of the talk. But then at the beginning of the talk, I'm going to give you some nonsense theoretical arguments, um, and, and that's everyone else's fault. Um, OK, so this, like Harry, so I, we, we sort of start at the beginning, namely with G.I. Taylor. So um, to my knowledge, the first person who asked this question in a seriously quantitative way was G.I. Taylor, who wrote this paper in 1936 in which he asked, basically, for a solution to the Navier-Stokes equation that amplified um, vorticity. And at the time, computers right, were um, you know, even more um, um, underdeveloped than they were when Lorenz did his work. And um, so Taylor um, resorted to getting a graduate student named Green to um, be his computer and to compute a Taylor series expansion of the Navier-Stokes equation to fifth order in time so that he could plot um, with tables of it, so he could plot the dissipation rate or the vorticity um, as a function of time. And he saw that the vorticity went up. It was amplified from the initial solution by about a factor of 10, depending on the Reynolds number. And then it started to go down. So the question, I think, that underlied all of this is that we all know, and basically at that time he also knew, even though it wasn't written down, about the turbulent cascade, that on average energy goes from large scale to small scale. But the question is, is to please identify the actual events that cause that transfer to be mediated. Um, so um, just in case you think that this isn't interesting, I'm going to show you an experiment that got me interested in this a couple of years ago. Um, this is an old experiment by Lim and Nichols in which what they did, here's a the movie, they took two vortex rings um, and they let them collide against each other. And there's a red one and a blue one and it formed an ex explosion. And if you, um, so it's sort of beautiful. And so here are sh frames from their movie. And what you see is you take a red ring and a blue ring and you collide them and you get little rings which are half red and half blue. And the paper was published in Nature because the editors were excited that the, um, the thing was half red and half blue. So now, of course, anyone who knows anything about fluid mechanics knows that that's completely ridiculous. I mean, of course they're half ring, red and half blue because you know the, vortex, the vortices, there's an instability which is well known in this experiment that leads to vortices which reconnect and make half red and half blue. So the interesting figure in this paper, however, was slightly later, you had to keep reading, um, in which the authors increased the Reynolds number um, and to about 3,500, look at this picture, and when they collide, they produced smoke. This is a blow up. And so, and it's really amazing, actually, because the time that this took, this was 2.74 seconds, the thing went from something coherent to smoke. And so the question is, so this is presumably happening constantly in a turbulent flow. This experiment was cleverly designed so that the phenomena was stationary in the laboratory frame. And so even at this point, they could take a picture of it. And the question is to please identify the dynamics that leads to this smoke. OK, so I, this, part, this talk has two parts. And Dan, please, like if I'm like four minutes before, tell me, because I just want to make sure I show you the, oh, the, oh, that's the time. 
wow, you guys are, I didn't know that. The speakers have a thing. Huh. Um, okay. <laughs> so anyway, this talk has two parts. The first part is theory, and I'm going to just give you a sketch of theory. And what I'm going to basically tell you about is a mechanism that we invented for some strange reason, which essentially involves iterative cascades occurring during this process. And then I'm going to show you Shmuel and Ryan's experiment in which they, they managed to visualize this um, in the experiment that I just showed you. So, okay, so in mathematics, the question that I'm talking about has been very popular in the last 20 years. 20 years? 20 years. Um, because it's, it's a famous problem. It's one of these clay problems. And in mathematics, people talk about this as the question of smoothness of the Euler or Navier-Stokes equations, which I must admit, um, I always thought was sort of boring because it's posed to be quite mathematical. I mean, on dimensional grounds, if u is the velocity field, the gradient of u has a, a, a scale which is 1 over a time. And so if it's time to a singularity where there's actual blow up of the vorticity, then the scaling law should look like this. And the math community has spent a lot of time studying whether or not this formula is correct. And basically, no one knows at this moment. Um, practically, whether or not there's a singularity is essentially irrelevant um, in practice. On the other hand, but what matters and what I think is really an important problem is to decide um, to identify what the mechanism is that's leading to this process, whether it's singular or not. It just doesn't really um, matter. And so the interesting thing about the experiment that I showed you is it shows you that something happens. And one would just like to be able to describe in some way what it is. And the, the notion is, is that because there's a clear scale separation, that is, you go from a big thing to like smoke something, then there should be some dynamics that one could characterize that, that governs that um, transition. So OK, so I'm going to just sketch calculations, and then I'll start talking more quickly um, so that I can get to the experiment. Um, so basically, we did a calculation in the simplest way. We started out with two rings, a red ring and a blue ring. And um, you, if, you, if you assume mathematically that the radius of the ring, that the core radius, is much smaller than the radius of curvature, then there's a very nice, simple description that one can write down and solve for the dynamics of the rings, which is basically the B.O. Savar law from electrostatics. And this law is not uniformly accurate, but it's, it's intuitive. And it's accurate as long as th these assumptions hold. And so we, we basically, um, I'm going to start by just showing you solutions of that for this ring problem. So there are two pieces of physics that are involved in these equations for two colliding rings. One is, is that there's the self-interaction of the filament. There's the fact that the filament interacts with itself. And that gives what I call the smoke ring law. It's because it's curved, you know, smoke rings translate. The other is, is that the two rings interact with each other. And if you look at the rings closely, they look like two-point vortices that are sort of next to each other. And that causes the ring to expand. So those are the two basic bits of physics that are in this equation. And so in order to sort of close this and think about it properly, you have to say something about what's happening to the core. And in the simplest model, right, because the core contains the vorticity, and in the simplest model, um, as the thing expands, then the core should shrink because the total amount of vorticity is conserved. And so one can basically um, sort of just write down a phenomenological law, which is also not, has been studied in the literature and is not so bad, that says that the area of the core basically decreases like one over the stretching rate um, of, the, um, of the thing. And so that means that the vorticity is actually growing like one over the area, or it's sort of growing like the stretching rate of the core. So OK, so, um, so this is a well-posed math problem that you can study if you're bored. It's correct as long as the core radius is small. And so we spent some time studying this. Let me just show you a simulation of this quickly. Um, so you see the core, these are two things that are coming together. There's a red one and a blue one. And they're actually, um, the curvature is actually diverging. So if you look, the curvature is diverging in this solution. Um, so it's actually a singularity of the B.O. Savar equations. The problem is, is that it's not a singularity that is, um, the singularity obeys scaling laws that basically says like the, that any scale goes like the square root of time. Um, and, the, um, and one can, as one does, if you're a physicist or whatever I am, sort of write down similarity solutions and characterize the dynamics. And you can do that in, I don't know, there's math. OK, and what you find is that the similarity solution that comes out looks like a double tent. So what it looks like is there's two tents, and the tents meet at a point. And the point is where all the action is. And basically, we spent a lot of time characterizing all the solutions of these tents. I don't know why. So double tents, if you look in the literature, have long been observed. So this is a paper from the 80s where there are two rings that are colliding. And you see they make double tents. Um, vortex reconnection often has double tents. 
Um, and we just checked, did simulations of this. This is Rodolfo, who is a postdoc at Harvard. Um, and this is the bo Savar equations. And you'll see that as they collide, they make lots of double tents. Double tents. So, um, so there are tents. So the action is happening in the tents. So what happens at the tents? The curvature blows up at the tents. So the thing is, is that if you look at the, the solutions, what you discover very quickly is that the core radius doesn't shrink quickly enough for the approximation that I just stated to be uniformly accurate. And so at some point, you lose double tents. And so what happens in practice, and everyone who studies fluid mechanics knows this, is that the tents flatten, and you have two flattened things. So we, um, um, this is hidden math. Um, basically, um, we're able to calculate how much flattening there is. That, that is, when these tents think, then how much does it flatten? And it turns out there's a formula which says that the aspect ratio, A is the, the you know, on this picture, A is this dimension and B is the this, this small thickness. This aspect ratio, um, the, this to this, um, basically goes like the radius of curvature of the ring or of the, of the perturbation divided by the core radius to a power, and the power is about two. Um, and this aspect ratio, this, if you put in actual numbers, this is a very, very large aspect ratio. So what this says, actually, just at the, from the point of view of theory, is that you will, just by colliding these things, make very small length scales very quickly. You will make very thin sheets. And so you can go and look at the literature, and there actually aren't thin sheets in the simulation literature. And the reason is because nobody's been able to resolve them. In fact, all the simulate, because it's just they become so thin so quickly when you simulate the damn thing that you basically run out of resolution, you know, given the resolution goes like the cube of the box and all that. And I mean, these are pretty ubiquitous. Anyway, so, um, so we then were sort of wondering. Now, of course, sheets are not smoke. And so um, there was a paper of Terry Tao that I don't have time to describe that was sort of interesting. And because of it, we were sort of wondering, well, what happens after you make the, the, um, the sheets, right? And that would make small scales. And so the following sort of picture emerged. So well, what happens to, um, to, to sheets of vorticity? And sort of if you read old literature like Lord Rayleigh, he tells you that sheets are unstable. And, um, and so that sheets are unstable. And there's a long literature about the instability of sheets. And so we thought, well, maybe you know, the, sh the, the, the filaments will create these sheets, and then the sheets will create more filaments. And then the filaments will again collide and make more sheets. And you see, it could just go around and around. You, you know what I mean? Again and again. And so, and then at this point, you become to the point where mathematics is impossible. You can't calculate in this regime that I can sort of describe to you. That it's not. But what we did, and this was sort of inspired by Lorenz, I think, at heart, was we did the only thing you could do, which is we made a map. We made a map. Like Lorenz had maps, so we had maps. We basically derived a map from our similarity solution, assuming that this is what happens. You know, please say how much vorticity, you know, how much circulation there is in every filament, and how what the thickness is, as, and could this actually continue? Forever, and what we discovered is that it is not inconsistent with the equations of motion that this would happen. But of course, that's far from a proof. Um, now, um, okay, so now we come to Shmuel, and um, so this experiment. So Shmuel, um, these guys are just great experimentalists. Anyway, I'm just going to show you. So I, instead of talking about it, they made a movie, and I'm just going to show you their movie. This was a, a movie of what they did, which I think summarizes the whole thing better than I could do. Oh shoot, it has to. As long as the movie plays. Oh, no, no, no. The movie has to play. This is the, this is the highlight of the talk. This is like one of these things. You, you know, it's the only part of the talk which is reasonable. OK, so here's their movie. So when vortex rings collide, they rapidly break in. So this is repeating the Lim and Nichols experiment. This is in a lab at the basement of a building at Harvard. And actually, if you can turn off the lights in front, actually, if you guys, if somebody could turn off the screen lights, because this is actually, this movie gets better. Sorry, I, I, I can brag about it because I didn't make it. Um, the, the, um, it, it was really nice. If you could, the, the lights right there. If somebody could turn them off. The Is it possible, you guys, to turn off the light? Okay, so you can't visualize from that. So what you, so what Shmuel did was to basically put a laser sheet in the center and to scan the laser sheet at very high field and then do three dimensional reconstructions of the um, of the thing. So these are the tents. You see the t so they, they break down. So these are scale bars. This is time. But now um, you can sort of see. OK, so now this is 3D high-speed scanning like microscopy. So there's a laser sheet, and it, it scans at a rapid rate. And then there's a three-dimensional reconstruction. Um,
It's amazing what you can do with modern software. This is experiment. I just wanted to be. be So dying, the technical details in this experiment were many, as you could imagine. So this is one core die. There's another core at the bottom that you can't see. OK, so now I want you to watch. Look, do you see this? It makes a sheet. Look how thin the sheet is. And now the sheet, sheet breaks. It makes a hole. There's a hole in the sheet. Now there are two more filaments. The hole, you can only make a hole in the sheet with viscosity. So for those of you who are interested in fluid mechanics, this is, so the viscosity has just come into the problem. But it's now gone because it's now very, very inertial. So do you see the threshold? There's a, a die threshold that you can change in the software. OK, now the tertiary filaments will go. And this is a single picture, actually. So this is one, this is actually a snapshot. There's no movie. You see one sheet to two filaments to tertiary filaments. OK, so that's the experiment. Like I said, that was by far the best part of this talk. So we also did numerical simulations. I only have 17 seconds left. Oh, I'm OK. I have four minutes. Oh, wow. That's the good way to do this, including questions. OK, well, I need to make sure there are no questions, so I should talk a lot. <laughs> so um, so, um, so we, did a, we did simulations. Actually, in simulations, it was a real challenge to basically get. Our goal was very modest in the simulations. We just wanted to see the seed of one iteration. That was it. And Rodolfo, who was a postdoc, managed to get this to work with the code. I, um, th this is sort of, this is part of it. Unfortunately, there are symmetry. This, this movie could be made better. Um, um, I, this actually, uh, in fact, what we ended up doing was dying, was, was sort of calculating the die as well as the vorticity. So I mean, one problem with the experiment, of course, is that you're measuring, the, you're measuring die. You're not measuring vorticity, and you might worry whether vorticity and die are the same thing. And you learn from these simulations that they are the same thing. And actually, if you go through this, you can see. Unfortunately, there's a symmetry. That, that's, that this thing is periodic. And so it's this way. But if you stare at it, you can see that it actually, if you look at the vorticity there, the die, you see it broke down into a thing. See this? Look. See it? Oh. See, there it goes. It went from one to two. OK, so that's the thing. I talk about more, but I only have a minute left. So let's see. So summary. So I guess th I was really surprised by this whole little endeavor. I, I sort of thought, first of all, that the question of whether there are singularities in the Euler equation was stupid. I also thought that, oh, this is probably recorded, actually. Oops. Um, um, <laughs> that is, I also thought that the question of whether the viscosity regularized it was also stupid, because of course it does. That was my opinion. And I also thought that, I thought lots of things. I also thought that the fact that no one had ever seen one in a simulation must meant that they couldn't exist because you know everybody's been trying like there are all these people who are trying and i guess now what i think is we're not even close to the computational power that it requires to do this the truth is the only way to resolve what i just showed you at the moment is with experiment there's no way to do this without massive remeshing in a simulation but if you do remeshing as many of you probably know you introduce stuff in the um, you introduce extra factors in the simulation which makes them much harder to control and to be sure that they're accurate um, the, in terms of the role of viscosity, you will notice that in the, in the experiment, you saw that the way that the cascade went was different than what we Im imagined in a certain sense, that the, the sheet formed and then the sheet actually popped. The popping of the sheet, there's a theorem, the popping of the sheet can only happen because of viscosity. So that meant it made such a small scale that viscosity came in then, but then it was not viscous anymore. Right, because it was then continuing, like as these filaments, which were massively going around very quickly. In fact, for a long time, Schmuel and Ryan were not able to see the, um, this, this phenomenon in the experiments, because what actually happens is, is when you pop the hole, then you have these vortex filaments, which are highly curved, and they start rotating very, very quickly. And if you don't time resolve fast enough, they rotate so quickly that it smears out. And it's exactly when the hole pops, so it's exactly when you'd like to see what is going on. But the fact that they start rotating quickly after the hole pops shows that this is a topological change that basically leads to um, the phenomenon. So I must admit, um, I don't really know what to do next. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I, you, you know, I mean, actually, Shmuel and Ryan are continuing to increase the Reynolds number. That was at a Reynolds number um, that was 
um, about 8,000 based on the, um, uh, on the instability wavelength. Um, they can go up in principle to 25,000. It is clear that things get more complicated as the Reynolds number goes up, although there seem to be remnants of this phenomena. For those of you who um, have thought about this before, the, um, there are other instabilities that occur with colliding filaments, and in particular, there's the famous elliptical instability, which was actually partly developed here in the math department with Willem Malkus and his collaborators, um, and, um, and also, in fact, uh, in aeronautics by Sheila Widnall and her collaborators. And so it's a MIT, the instability. Uh, the, but it's an instability which happens, which basically no one's ever really been able to understand the nonlinear features of, and it sets in. Um, but I, I sort of think this is very interesting. And if nothing else, it should provide a cautionary tale about how little you're resolving, even if you try. I'm done now. Oh, I should put up these people. These guys. Right there. Right. Uh, we have time for some questions. And there's one right here in the front. And then there'll be one in the back. Just a question to understand you better. You had two rings interacting, one of the figures, that ended up what we call islands. Could you? Let me have two rings of currents. There are two rings, and right. the rings collide. They are separated by vacuum that is infinite resistance. No, no, they're in water, actually. It's, a, it's an experiment done in water. No, but I'm referring to the theory. Oh, the theory, I see. Uh, well, no, no, the, the theory, I mean, they're, they're separated by a fluid. They're rings that are in a fluid. They're sources that there's, they're, I don't know what you mean by vacuum. No, it's because not. the problem, if you have two rings, yeah. and they are conducting currents. Oh, no, no, these aren't. There's no, there's no electricity. This is, okay. We're solving the, the Navier-Stokes equations, or the Euler equations. All right, all right. By the way, if you are interested in rings that carry current, there are, there are plenty of jobs for you. Rings? <laughs> 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 Laboratory plasmas or astrophysics. <laughs> what? Rings. Have you, have you ever heard of the smoke ring model of, of jets in uh, astrophysics? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's also under-resolved. <laughs> okay, one more question. Yeah, I, I, ju I, just, I just wanted to remark the elliptical instability was oh. basically oh, my no. thesis sorry, yeah, with sorry, Sheila. Right. I, but, I but I also okay. wanted to just mention some really beautiful work by Bruce Bailey yes. uh, that was done after, after uh, some years later, which gave a really nice analytical uh, interpretation of, of how the elliptical instability works. But you're completely right. We don't know what the nonlinear fate right. of the elliptical instability is and what, uh, how, what role, if any, it actually plays in the generation right. of and Actually, at some point, I would love to show yeah. you the movies of what happens when you go yeah. higher. Because yeah. the interplay between what I showed, which is basically the Crow instability yeah. and the elliptical instability, as you go through this, as the Reynolds number gets higher, yeah. is it, the experiments are fascinating. And it's sort of very hard to. But I apologize for getting the references wrong. Yeah. I didn't. That's what happens when things just start coming out of my mouth. I did get to Sheila, though, eventually. Yeah, you got yeah, Sheila. I did. <laughs> I got to Sheila. So it wasn't. <laughs> Thank you, Michael.